Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 119 of our 120-day Upper Room prayer campaign. And today, as we approach the end of this prayer campaign, I want us to see and understand what the Bible says is the conclusion of the whole matter. Because we don't want to just take pieces of this experience home with us, but we want it to fully encompass us, to change us. We want to grab hold of everything that the Holy Spirit has been saying to us. So today we want him to make it clear to us. God, show us the conclusion of the matter. My husband often preaches that God has made clear to us the answer to the age old question. What is the purpose of life? To which he replies, I have found it. It is written in the word of God. In fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, which was penned by Solomon, the wisest man ever to live by direct gifting of the Holy Spirit. At the end of this book of wisdom, where he pens all of the things that has been revealed to him, the mysteries of both spiritual things and the things of men, the very last verse, he concludes it with this. In chapter 12, verse 13, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. For every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In other words, in the end, everything in this life, all of the works of our hands, everything that we can ever hope to achieve or accomplish, It will vanish. It will be but ash in the end. Therefore, it is all vanity. The only thing that matters is that we have humbled ourselves and submitted under the mighty hand of God, fearing him and keeping his commandments. Because when the actions of our life are weighed and judged before the great judgment seat of Christ, Everything that we have done, every decision made will be brought to light before all of eternity. All of the saints and the angels and the elders, they will be there to witness this. And there will be one question asked, were we obedient to the word of God? In fact, Jesus said that it is literally the word of God that will be our judge because that it was presented to us and we had opportunity to come into agreement with it. So whether we did or did not will be proven by the fruits of our life. Did we set our sight on things eternal or did we try to make our home here on earth? Was it about us or was it about him? Did we really believe him? I have spent many, many hours every single day searching the heart of God for the words that he wanted to say as we released these prayer podcasts. And when I look back over the messages and the things that he brought forth day after day to show us his heart that I know was only the work of the Lord because I did not have it in me to achieve it in my own strength, I began to see that in reality, this is what he's been saying all along so that at the end of it I come to the same conclusion that Solomon did fear God and keep his commandments in other words humble yourself submit move in the wisdom that tells you that you have no understanding except for the knowledge that he delivers into our hand when we humble ourselves pray and seek him so we need to understand exactly what is his command as we come to the end of this prayer campaign because we have asked him for some pretty bold things we want salvations we want deliverances we want healings we want change in our cities and our nation we want him to move and be seen in undeniable ways we want a wave of truth of his word to spread forth through the earth we have prayed and cried out and sought him for what he had to say and at the end of it all i still hear him saying what he said at the beginning Pray, 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 tell them to pray. Because the conclusion does come to this. If we truly believe that he is who he is, then we will come to him every day and we will pray. 
for every need that we have, for every injustice that we see, for every heartache, every heartbreak, every encouragement that we seek. We will bend our knee if we truly fear God and if we trust him, we will love him and we will keep his commandments knowing that what he has told us is sure is true he is faithful he is just he is love and he will do what we cannot do but if we are looking for things for our own good then we will take matters into our own hands and begin to construct the ministries of man i want to take you for just a moment before we come to an end to matthew chapter 17 verse 1 and i want to show you something it says and after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. But while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. Let me explain to you what's taking place here, because it's a lesson that we need to learn so that we fear the Lord and move in his wisdom and don't make the mistakes that the disciples wanted to. They prayed. They fasted. They stayed on the mountaintop with Jesus. And then all of a sudden, there was a miracle manifestation. Jesus began to shine. His glory showed forth. He was transfigured before them. They saw him. He was revealed to them in a way that he had not been revealed to the greater body, to the others. These three who were the closest to him, who had spent all of this time in prayer and intercession with him because he was teaching them the power of it, how it connects you to the kingdom of God. And then all of a sudden, here is Moses and Elijah. They saw the miracle. They saw the manifestation. They got the revelation. And then what did they want to do with it? They wanted to build their own ministry out of it. This is how we get denominations. He said, let me build three different temples. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. You see, we always do this. We don't recognize that it's not about Moses or Elijah. It's not about David Wilkerson or Billy Graham or Catherine Kuhlman or Wesley or any of these personalities. It's about the God who walked with them. And we don't need to build movements after men. But they were so dazzled by the manifestation, by the miracle. They were so dazzled by that which God had allowed to validate Jesus, God was showing them, revealing to them who he was, and they still overlooked it because they were more impressed with the miracle that God brought forth for the sole purpose of proving the sonship and deity of Jesus. That's why as soon as Peter said, let us build temples to all three of you, The voice of God himself came out of the cloud and said, Behold, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He did not even acknowledge Moses or Elisha. What makes us think he needs to acknowledge us? And in this did Peter, James, and John fall on their face and were afraid. They got the fear of the Lord. They got wisdom. And as we come to the end of this, I truly believe that God is going to move in miracle manifestations before all of us in the revival coming and in each and every one of your lives. But no matter what may come, I want you to remember that it's not about you. It's not about us. It's never about a man. It's not even about the manifestation. It's about the one that is coming to validate before us. 
Jesus. And it's always there to prove that he is the son of God, the only begotten, the heir, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world that we might be atoned for by his blood and brought into the family of God. Every manifestation of the Holy Spirit, every miracle, every gift, every office, it has one purpose to point to Jesus, to believe what he said and obey it, that we might know the way of salvation. Oh, if we can grab hold of this, because the problem is, is that we're so easily impressed with the miracle. We're so easily impressed with the Mount of Transfiguration. We're impressed with the smoke and the cloud and the lightning and the personalities that surround him. Oh, it was amazing. They wanted to build temples around it. They wanted to build ministries. They wanted to stay there. Oh, let us stay here and continue to see these great and mighty things. But God's not about that. He's about going out and winning souls to the kingdom. The miracle comes to validate the message. The message is Jesus Christ. We see that in the story of Philip when it says that he preached Christ and miracles came to validate it. Because you see, Jesus, he didn't stay on that mountain. He didn't try to build a movement there. He didn't let them build temples and ministries and colleges and campuses. He said, go out. There's more work to do. There's another soul to reach. I'm not looking at earthly things. What I'm doing is going to affect eternity. And it's all to bring about the greatest miracle, salvation. The problem is, though, is that we're so enamored with the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, we want miracle services and we want to stay in them and we want to be wowed by them and dazzled by them and entertained by it. And we want men to know that we're a part of it. But there's a greater work to be done because you see, there came a time when those same disciples were with Jesus on another mount in the Garden of Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said, will you not pray with me one hour? Because the greatest work of grace was beginning to be poured out. And not one of them was willing to truly participate in it in the way that they ought to. They wouldn't pray. They wouldn't intercede. They kept falling asleep. Oh, we're so enamored with the miracles. We're so enamored with the majesty. We're so enamored with the personalities. We're so enamored with the Mount of Transfiguration. We want to build revivals. We want to stay there. We want to build movements and denominations. We want to keep people thinking that we're connected to that thing. But who's on their knees in the Garden of Gethsemane? Who's praying and interceding to be part of what God is really doing to birth through laboring prayer and travailing the greatest work of grace that will bring men to salvation because that's what God's working on that's what God wants that's the conclusion of the matter not to build what's pleasing to us not to seek the manifestations that give us the goosebumps and I'm not against it there's a place for it God promises it to us to show us his love and he does it to demonstrate that Jesus is who he says he is and that there's power in the blood there's a purpose in it these things have their place, but let us not worship the creation more than the creator, the net more than the God who fills it. The miracle is not what should drive our excitement and anticipation. The man or the personality or the woman that is being used in that hour is not the one that is worthy of our attention. It's all about Jesus. And if it's not about validating Jesus to bring men into the kingdom, to show them the power of his grace and and cause them to repent and come to salvation, then we've missed it. And God will not remain in it. And if we ever for a moment start to want to build temples on the Mount of Transfiguration, then we pray for God to speak out so loudly as he did that day. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Not Moses, not Elijah, not us, not the thunder or the lightning or the miracle or the manifestation, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's job is to speak of and point to and validate and make us a witness of Jesus. It's always got to be about Jesus and bringing souls into the kingdom. 
into agreement with his words, into salvation by faith, believing who he is, what he said, and what his atoning blood does. And if we can keep a healthy fear of God, as Peter and James and John experienced that day, then we will walk in wisdom and not try to build temples around what God himself did to validate Jesus. Because you see those disciples, those three, they did the wrong thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Because while they looked into the face of eternity, all they could think about was how they could capture a piece of it and keep it right here in the temporary. Yet on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, they did the wrong thing again because all they could see was the temporary. They failed to grab hold of the greatest moment in eternity. The most important thing they could have ever done in all the world was to pray that night. And they slept through it. Because it wasn't as impressive. It wasn't as spectacular. It wasn't as entertaining. And we all make this mistake every day. Salvation is the greatest miracle. Jesus was bringing salvation to mankind. And nobody offered to build a temple. They wouldn't even stay up and pray. They wouldn't even intercede. They wouldn't do the important thing. The needed. They were willing to labor in vain for that which was vanity on the Mount of Transfiguration, but they did not do the needed thing in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that for all her laboring, when Martha rebuked Mary for sitting at Jesus' feet, Jesus rebuked Martha and said, Mary is doing what is needed. They wanted to build a temple. They wanted to build a movement. They wanted to put his name in lights on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus said, no. Jesus said, will you sit up and pray with me tonight on the Mount of Olives? And the disciples said, no. If we would but fear God and keep his commandments, we would stop missing our moments of destiny. The Bible never said Labor without ceasing, it never said. Sing without ceasing, it never said. Preach without ceasing, it never said. Organize without ceasing, it never said. Do anything without ceasing except pray without ceasing. If the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God enough to keep his commandments, what are his commandments? Pray, pray, pray. Can you not pray with me one hour that souls might be saved? Pray without ceasing. The Bible says, first of all, let prayers and intercessions be made for all men. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, would pray and humble themselves and repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear from heaven and heal their land. If you believe who he is and what he says, and if you fear him, you will pray because judgment is coming. And there is nothing that we can build with our hands that will withstand it. But if you will pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, God will turn it into salvations. We spend so much time chasing after signs, wonders, and miracles on the Mount of Transfiguration. But we were never meant to. We were meant to pray and cry out to God and intercede for men. If we truly believe him, we will do this. And then signs, wonders, and miracles will follow after us because that we have believed. Because we have met the conclusion of the matter. We have feared God and kept his commandments. So let me ask, when we do pray, do we pray more for miracles? Than salvations? Do we rejoice more over healings than over salvations? Are we drawn more to manifestations than to salvations? Because if it is the case, then we're still stuck on the Mount of Transfiguration and we're not on our knees in the Garden of Gethsemane where we need to be, where the need is, where the greater work is, where the birthing of real Pentecost begins. Because the Bible says that heaven rejoices over one soul that is saved. Oh, we love the supernatural power of God. But true God birthed miracles 
only come to validate the message of Jesus Christ unto salvation for the lost. Not to validate a man, a movement, or a ministry. Don't build a temple on the Mount of Transfiguration. Instead, teach others the power of prayer by staying spiritually awake so that you can pray and push through the night in intercession with Jesus in the garden to see men brought to repentance and salvation. The manifestations make men rejoice, but it's the salvations that make heaven rejoice. I want to be found rejoicing with heaven. I would rejoice more over one soul that is saved and brought into the kingdom for eternity than over a thousand healings. I'm not against healings. I've been part of many of them. I've seen them with my own eyes. God is so compassionate and so loving and so merciful. And through his compassion, he brings healing. And through his workings, he brings miracles. But there's a purpose in it. And I think we rejoice more over the manifestation than the reason for it and that is to bring men to salvation so my friend if you can see one man brought in to the kingdom of God then you have been part of the greatest miracle of all I love it when Leonard Ravenhill would often say that the greatest miracle is not healing the sick or raising the dead The greatest miracle is that God can take an unholy man out of an unholy world, put his Holy Spirit in that unholy man and make that unholy man holy, then put him back in an unholy world and keep him holy. That is a miracle and it's worth rejoicing over because in the end, when we stand before God and all of this world is turned to ash, those miracle healings won't matter. That financial blessing, it won't matter anymore. All of the things that we've spent our time praying and asking for, it's going to be ash before us. The only thing that will last are the souls of men. So how many have you prayed in? How many have you rejoiced with heaven for as they accepted him as their Lord? This is the conclusion of the matter. Don't put the cart before the horse. We love miracles. We thank God for the mighty workings and the power of his Holy Spirit. But the purpose for it is not to validate men or build their kingdoms or their ministries or their temples on the Mount of Transfiguration where they will spend the rest of their days talking about what they did to cause the lightning and the thunder. It's to point to Jesus. And how he revealed to us that he is the son of the living God in whom the father is well pleased. This is what caused me to believe it. I give you my testimony. I pray that you receive it and believe it also. Because what good is a healed body with a damned soul? It's got to be about repentance. It's got to be about salvation. It's got to be about Jesus. And if it ever strays from that, then it's evidence that we do not fear God or keep his commandments, which was the purpose in every word that the Holy Spirit has spoken to us in these last 120 days. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Obey Simple, selfless, obedient, childlike faith. It's not complicated. Salvation, the full manifestation of God's love. We look for blessings and temporary things. We look for miracle manifestations and we praise God for them. May we always point back to Jesus when we speak of them because that is their purpose. But to me, An even greater miracle is that he loves us. After all we've done to him, we don't deserve him. He doesn't need us. And yet he loves us. What a miracle that is. That he can cause us to love our enemies. To forgive them. What a miracle that is. That he can put his spirit within us and produce his character through us. 
that we might help others and live godly in this life. What a miracle that is, that I'm not who I used to be, that I'm changed, that I'm set free from fear and bondage and all the works of the enemy. What a miracle that is to me. We should live every day seeing miracles. I do believe in miracles. I love Catherine Kuhlman's famous quote because it's so simple and yet so profound when she would say every day, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. If you believe in God, how can you not believe in miracles? He is an omnipotent, all-powerful God. He is the God of miracles. Nothing is too hard for him. To acknowledge that he is God is to acknowledge that miracles are nothing to him. Therefore, if I believe in him, I have to believe in miracles or I don't really believe in him and who he is. Of course I believe in miracles and I thank him for them. I just don't like when I see people worshiping them or idolizing them when it was really all about pointing to him. Let's remember this. Let's fear God and keep his commandments. God, give us a heart as we come to an end to this prayer podcast and this 120 days of seeking your heart and your word and coming into agreement with it, that we would always remember that all of it comes back to obedience, to loving you enough to trust you, to have faith in everything that you've said and to pray daily that we might hear you, be taught by you, be led by you. Oh God, let us not look more to the things that happen on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yes, praise God, they prayed and you came and we thank you for it and it validated who Jesus is. But let us go forth preaching the message of Jesus Christ because the miracle comes to validate the message, not the man, not the ministry and not the manifestation. We thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness. Lord, let us never become too bored or too spiritually lazy or too unimpressed with the Garden of Gethsemane that we will not bend the knee and pray with you that men might be brought to salvation, that we might press through because that's what really breaks through when we call on you, on your name, when we trust you and pray. My friends, if there's anything I can leave with you today, is that we must pray, is that it's not what we build that's going to change things. It's prayer. God will shake the nations when his people pray. God will change the generations when his people pray. God will pour out the miracle manifestations that validate his name and his grace when people pray, if we will humble ourselves, if we will obey, if we will pray. It's what he says to do throughout scripture, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others more than ourselves. And if we truly do love him, then we will spend that time with him. And if we truly do love others, then we will spend time coming before him and petitioning him for them. The word of God says before anything else, pray and intercede before anything else, pray and intercede before anything else. Pray and intercede before organizing, agonize, before building things break before the king, before preaching and prophesying, lay prostrate before the Lord and hear his word. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto you. In the end, we've got to come to understand that all he wants from you is faith and faith will be manifested and evidenced through your obedience and your willingness, and your desire to meet with him and pray. Lord, impress this upon us all the days of our life. The needed ministry, the powerful ministry, that thing which truly changes things because it causes your spirit to come in and do what no man can because your word is sure. That if we will call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. When the righteous cry out, God comes down from his holy mount. Everything that we need is found in the place of prayer. Because faith is found there. Knowing that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So find your place of prayer. And meet him there. He will show up. 
And when he shows up with lightnings and thunders and miracle manifestations, don't forget what got him there. Don't worship your net. Worship the God who puts the fish in it. Don't build a temple on the Mount of Transfiguration. Go out into all the world to every tribe, tongue, and nation and tell of the Jesus that the miracles came to validate and lead them to salvation. This is the conclusion to the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. So as we close today, I think if there's one thing the Lord would want to say at the end of this time of fellowship, prayer, intercession, and communion with him, it would be, don't forget me. I ever live to make intercession for men. Don't leave me praying alone like the disciples in Gethsemane did. We've prayed daily and he has heard our cry. He will answer with power, with fire, and with might. His spirit will pour out and do great and mighty things. But once he does, don't forget the one who did it. It's not about us. It's for his glory. Let us fear him enough to not dare steal it from him. Let this not be a one-time event, but let it be a lifelong lesson that starts us on a path of continual service to him in communion, prayer, and intercession. After all, that is his occupation, and he made us for fellowship. Let us dare not forsake him in it, to build ministries of our own making on the stories of what happened at our Mount of Transfiguration. So I leave you with this, the words of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 12. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him. And in this we see, that to fear him and keep his commandments, and fulfill the whole duty of man, is simply the fulfillment of not forgetting him. So commit to him today to continue to pray, to come back to this place of prayer and intercession and communion with him. He created us to walk with him. He created us for fellowship. His desire is communion. He asked for it. Do it. Do it in remembrance. Do it in obedience. Do it in fear and reverence, and do it in appreciation. Lord, we will not forget. We thank you in advance for the things that you are about to do. We thank you for all that you have already done, and we commit to continue to come and sit with you. You are God. You are good. You are worthy of it. But above all of that, you are my first love my heart's desire, and I want to. I will not forget.